Good afternoon. I'm Attorney General Eric Schneiderman, and uh, we're here issuing the first report that our office has generated as a result of our work uh, as special prosecutor pursuant to an executive order issued by uh, Governor Cuomo on July 8th of last year. Uh, the report and exhibits are available, and as we'll discuss, we also have a link uh, to video available through our OAG website. Uh, last year, when Governor Cuomo issued his executive order, uh, he appointed me a special prosecutor, and I quote from the order, in certain matters involving the death of an unarmed civilian, whether in custody or not, caused by a law enforcement officer. Uh, after receiving the order, we worked in the Office of the Attorney General to set up a Special Investigations and Prosecution Unit, which is headed by my Executive Deputy Attorney General Alvin Bragg, who you'll hear from in a few minutes. Other members of our Special Investigations and Prosecutions team are here as well, uh, including Deputy Chief Wanda Perez Maldonado, Deputy Chief Jennifer Summers, Counsel Gail Heatherly, Assistant Attorney General Matthew Ross, and Chief Investigator Dominic Zarella and Investigator John Sullivan. Um, sadly, only two weeks after the executive order was issued, Raynette Turner died in a jail cell in Mount Vernon. Her death was a tragedy. While the precise cause of her death was at the time uncertain, after receiving a conforming order from Governor Cuomo uh, that confirmed our jurisdiction over this case, our office's special investigations and prosecutions team uh, started an investigation into this very sensitive and, to us, very important matter. During the course of this investigation, our team left no rock unturned. They examined every piece of evidence, they interviewed every available witness, and they took unprecedented steps to ensure that as much of the evidence we gathered as possible would be publicly available. Uh, this final point is extremely important. Investigations of police-related civilian deaths in New York have usually been sh shrouded in secrecy. Uh, that is not true today. As Alvin will discuss in detail, we took steps throughout the investigation to ensure that we could provide a high level of transparency. The stated purpose of the governor's executive order was to restore public confidence in the process through which law enforcement is investigated in cases in which an unarmed civilian dies. We believe that greater transparency is a critical part of restoring that confidence. Uh, before coming here today, our team spoke with the members of Raynette Turner's family. They are still mourning the loss of a mother, a wife, and a friend. Uh, I offered them, and we have offered them, our condolences. We walked them through the investigation, told them of our findings. And we've also been in touch with the Mount Vernon Police Department and with Mayor Thomas and received their full cooperation. Uh, the Office of Court Administration has also fully cooperated and been very helpful in this matter, as we'll discuss. This investigation uh, spans more than seven months and included interviews with 45 witnesses, including employees of the Mount Vernon Police Department, court personnel, acquaintances of Ms. Turner, and uh, arrestees who were in the custody of the Mount Vernon Police Department at the same time as Ms. Turner. We reviewed surveillance video spanning virtually the entire duration of Ms. Turner's confinement. The Mount Vernon Police Department had video cameras in pretty much every relevant location, including video cameras that provided a view into the cells so we could actually see everything that happened, what Ms. Turner's interaction was with jail personnel and everything else that was going on. This is not true of a lot of uh, detention facilities in New York, but it enabled us to do a much more thorough job than usual, and we are making a link available to the videos of the last hours of her confinement. We also studied the aut autopsy report, uh, microscopy and toxicology results, as well as over 1,700 pages of Ms. Turner's medical records prior to and during her confinement. Uh, we have concluded from all of this that there is no criminal culpability in the death of Ms. Turner. However, our investigation did uh, uncover some areas of, of, of real problems and areas in need of reform. So today, pursuant to our authority under the executive order, uh, we're releasing the report documenting our investigation. We're also releasing the autopsy, including toxicology results, and setting up the link, as I mentioned, to the surveillance video that captures the last hours of Ms. Turner's confinement. So you will all be able to see her movements, activities, and interactions with Mount Vernon Police Department personnel in her final hours. 
the press release has instructions for how to get to that link. And finally, as I indicated before, we're making several very important policy recommendations that we believe would improve the administration of justice in future cases. And I sincerely hope that our colleagues in local government, law enforcement, uh, and the state legislature will seriously consider these reforms as we move ahead. We'll discuss these recommendations in greater detail and then take questions. Uh, but now I want to thank the team and turn this over to the Chief of Special Investigations and Prosecutions Unit, uh, Alvin Bragg, who will walk you through the details of our investigation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Attorney General. I want to start with an outline of what I want to walk through for the next half hour or so. Um, uh, some background uh, and then a timeline of uh, the three days or so that Ms. Turner spent in custody, uh, then talk a bit about the autopsy, uh, then talk about the legal analysis, and then turn to the policy recommendations that the Attorney General just mentioned. Uh, so starting with the steps that we took, the Attorney General uh, just talked a bit about this. Um, we examined uh, the autopsy records from the medical examiner. Um, we reviewed uh, all of the video uh, that was relevant, multiple uh, video cameras, as the Attorney General stated. Uh, we conducted more than 40 witness interviews, uh, including not just of uh, police personnel, but of uh, other people who were detained at the same time uh, as Ms. Turner and we reviewed more than uh, 1,700 pages of medical records, uh, both uh, while Ms. Turner was in custody, because she was taken to the hospital while she was in custody, and also uh, hospital records prior to that time. Um, the uh, medical examiner's report, uh, which is uh, attached as Exhibit B to uh, our report, uh, very importantly, uh, found no indication of any physical abuse, no, uh, no trauma suggesting that there was any physical abuse. And that finding uh, uh, w was corroborated by other things in our investigation. Um, there, were, there was no one who we uh, interviewed who even suggested uh, any uh, indication of uh, physical abuse. Uh, and then on the videos, which we reviewed in detail, uh, there was also no indication. So that's a, uh, a very critical uh, a finding in the investigation. Uh, the autopsy and the, the medical examiner found that the cause of death was natural, uh, caused by an enlarged heart, uh, and that a contributing factor was uh, chronic drug use. Again, that's attached uh, as Exhibit B, and we will go into that in uh, some detail. Uh, given that the cause of death um, was natural and that there was no physical abuse, a focus, the main focus of the investigation became the type of care and attention that Ms. Turner received while she was in custody. So I'm gonna turn to that. Uh, again, this is just all by way of overview. We'll go into more uh, detail. Um, as I mentioned, there was a hospital visit, so Ms. Turner was arrested on a Saturday. She was in custody uh, Saturday afternoon, uh, and on Sunday, Sunday afternoon, she requested uh, to go to the hospital for hypertension medication, uh, and she was taken, uh, and then uh, brought back Sunday evening. Uh, she began to vomit or retch uh, on Sunday night. Uh, and in the morning, uh, uh, there were two separate inquiries from uh, uh, police officers asking about her health. Uh, and she uh, specifically indicated that she was feeling better and did not ask to be taken back uh, to the hospital. Uh, and then the last bullet point, uh, you know, throughout the weekend, uh, there, are, there are periodic checks of the cell, cell visits. Uh, and you can see those uh, on the video. Uh, so again, I'll go into all that in more detail, but that is uh, sort of all by way of background. And then uh, we'll start the more specific timeline. So as I mentioned, Ms. Turner was uh, uh, arrested for, uh, uh, she was arrested for shoplifting um, on Saturday. And at 2.40, uh, she was first brought into the police department. Uh, these stills, uh, which are in the report, are still photos taken from the video uh, that the Attorney General mentioned. So you can see her uh, being brought into uh, custody at around 2.40. Shortly after that, uh, she was uh, processed. Uh, and as part of that uh, process, um, which is customary for everyone who's arrested, it's a check, uh, primarily a suicide prevention check. Uh, and a sergeant asked her a number of standard questions. And during that inquiry, uh, she spoke about a prior uh, mental health 
uh, diagnoses, or prior mental health diagnoses, excuse me. Um, uh, she re requested medication uh, rela relating uh, to that prior condition or conditions, um, but she didn't make any complaints about her, or her physical condition. Um, so at the conclusion of that uh, intake interview, the sergeant placed her in, into what's called active uh, supervision, uh, which meant that she was going to be checked on every 15 minutes. Uh, there's constant supervision, which is if you're deemed to be a suicide risk, that'd be sort of 24-7. And then there's nom normal uh, uh, check-ins, which would be every 30 minutes. So she was placed into the middle classification. This is just an overview of the rest of the day on, on Saturday um, and also on Sunday until the time when she made the request uh, for medication. Um, so this has a, a couple of, uh, uh, of you know, she's escorted to the cell around 3 o'clock. 5.15, she has dinner. Uh, 8 a.m., she has breakfast. And in between, she's uh, sleeping off and on, uh, you know, walking around the cell. There's also a bench in the cell, uh, and there's a toilet as well. Uh, and all that uh, is, is captured on the videos we've been talking about. Around 4.30 is when she makes the request for hypertension medication. Um, acting on that request about an hour and 15 minutes later, she was uh, taken to the, uh, the hospital, which uh, to understand the geography a little bit, it's about a block and a half away. Um, but for everyone's safety, they take the, uh, the patrol car. Uh, so this is her walking to the car. So she gets to the, the hospital, and, uh, and as I said, we've taken a look at the medical records. Uh, her chief complaint uh, was needs meds, which is consistent with what uh, she told the police department. Uh, in addition to her medication requests, she also complained about pain on her left side. Um, before she was uh, discharged, she was there for about four hours. She saw a psychiatrist, uh, physician, physician uh, and a nurse, uh, and she was provided with uh, medications that are there on the bottom of the screen, and those are all medications that she was previously prescribed. So they were you know, bridge medications to sort of bridge her to the time uh, when she would be released uh, from custody. Uh, importantly, uh, the police department was not provided with any sig uh, specific discharge instructions, uh, and the instructions given to Ms. Turner uh, were that uh, she should follow up with her care providers upon her release. So again, she was there for about four hours. Um, so this is uh, around the time when she returns. We're now back uh, at the Mount Vernon Police Department. And uh, as you can see, she's walking unassisted. Uh, and she's uh, on her way uh, back to a cell. Uh, when she gets there, she eats. Uh, she lays on a bench in the cell. Um, and it's around this time that she, be she be begin to see a sign of illness. She, she is, uh, you can see on the video, she appears to be vomiting or retching. Uh, so this is early Monday morning, and by that I mean uh, 2.15 2 or so in the morning. Uh, she's uh, brought out of the cell uh, to be fingerprinted. Um, and as you can see, she walks uh, unassisted, and she walks uh, uh, down to an area where she is fingerprinted by a couple of detectives. And the next slide uh, shows her return, uh, which is about uh, uh, 15 minutes later. Uh, and we're about around 2.30 in the morning now. Um, again, she's uh, here walking unassisted. And for the rest of the night, she slept off and on. Um, and her sleep was interrupted um, at various times uh, and what appears to be vomiting or retching on the video. takes us to uh, it's later Monday morning, around uh, 9.30 in the morning. Uh, Ms. Turner was uh, taken out of her cell for a pretrial services interview. And pretrial, uh, their function is to uh, interview the uh, arrestee and to gather information to make a uh, recommendation to the judge about uh, uh, release or bail. Uh, the office is independent from the police department. Uh, so she goes and she has the interview. Uh, she conveys to the interviewer that she was not feeling well. Um, she did not uh, request uh, medical assistance. Um, and the interviewer who we interviewed um, uh, determined uh, that uh, there was no cause for concern. She wasn't feeling well, but she did 
not uh, uh, view it as uh, anything uh, significant in her perception at that time. Uh, after she leaves, she walks back, uh, was escorted back, um, and uh, walks unassisted uh, back to a cell. Uh, she's there for about 10 minutes, uh, and then she's taken to the holding cells uh, uh, on another level of the court, one flight away, uh, for arraignment. And this slide here is of her. She's come back from the pretrial interview, and it's about 15 minutes later, and she's uh, walking uh, back to the cells, or not back to, she's walking to the cells, uh, which is where, where uh, um, arrestees are held adjacent to the, to the courtroom. Uh, and for privacy reasons, we don't have the pictures of uh, the other arrestees with her, but she was uh, with uh, a few other arrestees. So once she got to the uh, cell adjacent to the courtroom, she was not there for uh, long at all, or maybe a minute or so before she asked uh, one of the officers to go back to the cell uh, she'd been in so she could lie down. Um, as I mentioned, there were other people who had been detained with her, um, so that statement was corroborated by a, a non-police uh, department employee. Um, so she's taken out of the cell that's adjacent to the courtroom, uh, and when she's en route back to the cell you, you've seen earlier, um, she, she was asked about her health uh, by two uh, separate uh, uh, police department employees. Um, to the first, uh, she indicated, I feel a little better, as you see on the screen. Uh, and then to the second, she said, I'm doing okay, or words to that effect, I just want to go lie down. Uh, so she was uh, taken uh, uh, back to a cell, uh, and you see her uh, in the cell um, doing, as she said, lying down for a bit. Um, uh, you see her um, walking back before she gets her walking unassisted, lying down for a bit, and you also see her vomiting or retching um, uh, several times. A couple hours after this, this is uh, uh, 10 a.m. These events on the slide here started at 10 a.m. A couple hours after that, at around 12.30, uh, Ms. Turner was moved uh, uh, to a different cell. Um, so just to make sure everyone is following along, we have her uh, at the, at the cell that's adjacent to the courtroom. She goes back uh, to a cell, um, which we'll call this the, the cell block just for clarity, and she's there for a couple of hours, uh, and then she's moved to another cell also on this row. Um, and so this, this picture is of her walking, um, again unassisted, um, to another cell on this row down the hallway. Um, and throughout the last couple of hours that I've been telling you about, there was uh, no, no request for any additional you know, medical attention or return uh, to the hospital. The request was just to, uh, to lie down. So that's cell 23. You'll see this as she walks to cell 29, uh, and this is about a half hour later, and she is uh, in, the, in the cell, and there's an attendant indicating that there's food uh, and drink in the door opening. Uh, 1.10, uh, about 20 minutes or so later, uh, another attendant walks by and then provides her with uh, uh, toilet paper. And 1.11, uh, again, about 20 minutes after that, um, you can see an attendant looking in, uh, and you see Ms. Turner uh, leaning over uh, and appearing to vomit or retch. 1.21, uh, she's standing up. Uh, and drinking, I don't know if you can sort of make it out with the bars there, but she's drinking uh, from a cup. Uh, and then a few minutes after that, around 1.25, uh, she laid down. In fact, actually, I got ahead of myself. Uh, this 1.21, she, she, she goes to lay down, and she's laying down um, for some time. 2.10, uh, she's still laying down, and the officers, you see the officers walking by, um, uh, the cells looking in. And then at uh, 2.50, um, an officer goes, and he was going to uh, get her to take her back to the arraignment court for arraignment. Um, he goes in and checks on the cell, notices that uh, she's not moving, uh, reaches through the cell, 
um, shakes her and she was un unresponsive. So they then go in, in the cell. The uh, person who is leaning over, Ms. Turner, is uh, doing what's called a sternum rub, trying to uh, rouse her. Uh, that uh, did not uh, work. And about uh, 10 minutes later, uh, you see the EMT is there. Um, between that time, someone uh, from uh, the, the police department gone in with, uh, uh, to try to, to render uh, more aid and it noticed some, some signs of lividity, which are a pooling of blood, which is a sign of death. Um, and here at 304, the EMTs are there and they are examining Ms. Turner um, and she was uh, pronounced uh, dead at uh, 308. Um, so that's the sort of first, the, the sort of detailed walkthrough of her time. I want to go back uh, momentarily uh, to the autopsy. You know, from that time, uh, which was, that was uh, 3 o'clock, her body was then uh, removed around 5 o'clock and taken to the medical examiner. An autopsy was performed. Um, we sort of recovered this before, so I will not... Uh, repeat myself, but that again is uh, what, the, uh, what the autopsy, uh, what, what the medical examiner found, it's in the autopsy, which is Exhibit B uh, to our report. Um, but what I do want to spend some, some time on, um, which I haven't talked out about yet, is uh, the legal analysis. So those are the, you have an overview of the facts uh, distilling down our uh, seven-month investigation. Uh, having uh, determined uh, that there was no no physical abuse, no assault uh, by an officer. As I said, the, the, the inquiry shifted to sort of the attention and care. Um, the only conceivable legal theory for uh, a homicide prosecution would be criminally negligent homicide under those facts. Um, and the focus would be on the failure, uh, if there was any failure to provide medical care and if that failure uh, resulted um, in Ms. Turner's death. Um, as you heard from the Attorney General, you know we, we concluded that it did not, but I wanted to walk everyone through um, our legal analysis. So these two bullet points are uh, uh, the findings necessary to, su to sustain a charge of criminally negligent homicide. Um, you have to prove a failure to perceive a substantial and unjustifiable risk of death. And you have to prove that that failure constituted a gross deviation from reasonable care. Um, and so, you know, what does that mean? We lay out in the report, we walk through illustrative case law, um, but just to sort of uh, put it in shorthand, the cases that, 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 that in look at this area all deal with circumstances where there was a imminent death that was readily apparent. And we, we cite a number of them in our report, and I just wanted to go through a couple today to, to, to give everyone the sense that the facts that, that I walked through on the timeline, um, uh, while disturbing, obviously difficult and tragic, uh, do not uh, rise to the level and are nowhere near the type of facts uh, uh, where courts have found and sustained a charge for criminally negligent homicide. So I you start with People v. Uh, Manning, uh, which is a third department case, appellate case, um, and you can see the facts are, are uh, very disturbing. It's a newborn uh, boy, uh, died of undernutrition and uh, dehydration. Uh, his mother was convicted for criminally negligent homicide. Um, and just to do it very quickly, it's before you. The mother missed a medical appointment for the newborn two days before. You see the newborn lost a lot of body weight um, uh, since his last medical appointment. Um, unlike here, there was trauma uh, to the newborn's uh, body. Um, and the defendant expressly refused uh, assistance from a nurse. People v. Henson um, involved a four-year-old boy um, who was sick uh, for some days. Uh, the parents were convicted for criminally negligent homicide. And you see sort of the, the pertinent facts distilled there. I mean, again, the, the, the case is described in more detail in our report, uh, but the body was covered with uh, black and blue marks. Uh, the parents went to a bar the night of the death, tied the son up, and instructed a babysitter uh, to ignore his calls for help. And just one last, uh, one last case, People v. Northrup. Um, uh, the defendant mother here was convicted. She saw her uh, boyfriend uh, beat her son. Um, 
with a stick and slapped the boy. The slap was uh, so hard that uh, the, the boy's uh, head uh, struck and uh, broke the glass of a medicine cabinet. Um, and then perhaps most disturbingly, the mother saw the boyfriend uh, force the son to eat excrement. Uh, and the mother also saw blood in the son's urine and observed frequent retching. Um, so uh, those cases are illustrative. Uh, go through them, uh, not at all to be sensational. They're the law in this area, and I think they help contextualize uh, the, the facts here. Um, and uh, our, our legal conclusion is just the facts uh, surrounding Ms. Turner's death are not uh, 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 like these. Um, and it boils down to a couple of key considerations, the responsiveness, uh, uh, which I talked about, uh, and uh, the fact that it was not clear that imminent death was, uh, was not readily apparent. Um, on the responsiveness, these are things that are on prior slides, but just to mention them, now that I've mentioned the law, um, you know, Ms. Turner was taken to the hospital. Uh, she was specifically asked twice how she was doing um, upon her return. Um, you saw on several of the slides, attendants walking by and looking in on her. Um, and in fact, uh, in the past, uh, uh, in, the, in the last few hours of her life, there uh, 10 attendants who walk by uh, uh, and or look in. Uh, so uh, that level of responsiveness certainly is very different from the, the, the few cases I just discussed a few moments ago. Um, and uh, while obviously you can see from the pictures, you see her vomiting or retching, um, uh, it was not uh, readily apparent that death was imminent. Um, as uh, most in the room know, uh, vomiting or retching um, certainly can be evidence of a serious medical condition, but it's uh, symptomatic of many non-fatal conditions as well. Um, several of the slides, you also saw that she was walking unassisted uh, back and forth, which uh, you know a reasonable person would be uh, able to conclude and rely upon that she was doing okay, she was well enough to walk, and certainly that not that there was imminent death um, uh, that was soon to happen. Um, so that's just to sort of uh, talk about the facts just a little bit, having talked about the law. Um, this is all laid out in greater detail um, in, uh, in our report. Um, and now I want to sort of move from our, 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 uh, our sort of pure factual findings and talk about uh, some of the uh, implications or sort of broader issues that were flagged. Um, I mean, even though, even though there was no criminal liability here, um, we certainly observed uh, significant ways that our criminal justice system can be improved. Um, and I'm going to go through a few of those now. Just to, to start with one, which is uh, specific to the Mount Vernon Police Department, um, uh, but before I do that, I want to say that these steps and the, the reforms that we suggest this afternoon, um, they don't speak to sort of what caused uh, Ms. Turner's death, but we make these recommendations uh, with the hope of improving our system going forward more, more generally. So the first thing we noted was a, a, a failure of, of, of good record keeping. Uh, I mentioned earlier when uh, Ms. Turner uh, was brought into custody. She did the, so there was an intake interview and there were uh, different classifications, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, or sort of constant supervision. Uh, those visits are noted uh, on a log. Um, and as you might think, we rely primarily on the video um, as sort of first, first eye uh, um, evidence, but we also looked at the log and compared it to the video um, and we noted several inconsistencies between the log and the video. You know, some perhaps were attributable to an attendant using a different watch and being off by a few minutes. Um, um, but you'd see things where on the log, it would say that someone was laying down, but you check the video and the person would be sitting up. So it may be that there are, you know, different uh, time, uh, time keeping devices being used. Um, but there were a, a, a couple of, of of uh, inconsistencies that were clear errors on Monday morning by one of the attendants. Uh, a different time for lunch was marked down than what was shown on the video. Um, a different time for when Ms. Turner was moved cells. Um, and we noted on the logs the attendant uh, went back and sort of changed uh, 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 some of the entries, did so in a sort of very sort of clear way that it was clearly um, changed, so you know, not, not appearing to, to hide the change. But in any event, inaccurate. Um, and while here there's the video, um, and that, that's what's relied on principally 
Um, you know, the, 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 the record keeping is also very important. Um, so we've called uh, um, this to the police department's attention that they need to take a look at their record keeping. Um, uh, and uh, they've responded. Our understanding is that um, they plan to discipline uh, the attendant who uh, made those uh, uh, log entries um, and uh, made those changes. Uh, we also have uh, some broader sets of uh, policy recommendations that go beyond the Mount Vernon Police Department. Um, they fall into two broad categories. Uh, the first is getting uh, detainees or arrestees to court um, for arraignment uh, or uh, getting uh, pre-arraignment release, doing that in a more uh, expedient manner. That's the first. Uh, and the second are uh, issues relating to uh, arrestee or detainee medical care. Um, so this first slide speaks to um, uh, arraignment issues. Um, and and the, the, the Court of Appeals, uh, which is the highest court in New York, um, has ruled that uh, pre-arraignment pre delays in excess of 24 hours are um, presumptively unreasonable. I mean, here, Ms. Turner was in custody uh, um, from uh, Saturday early afternoon uh, until Monday, uh, which exceeds that 24-hour period, obviously. Um, and uh, that was so because court was closed. Uh, court closes, there's no court on Saturday afternoon in Mount Vernon, and there's no court on Sunday in Mount Vernon. Um, and that's, that's, that schedule is true for uh, much of our state. Um, so we, we are proposing that um, policymakers uh, uh, take a close look at uh, video conference arraignments. Um, this is a technology that is uh, in use in other states that uh, can be used to expedite arraignments. Uh, and in our state, uh, it's, it, it's permitted legislatively, um, but only in, in, f in fewer than half of uh, New York's counties. Uh, Westchester is one county where it is permitted. Uh, so we uh, call upon and suggest that uh, Mount Vernon and other localities explore that option. Uh, and then we call upon the legislature to uh, look at uh, that option uh, statewide. Uh, for someone in Ms. Turner's situation, if uh, videotape arraignment uh, were available on a Saturday, uh, she could have been arraigned remotely and uh, depending upon the judge's determination, released from custody. Or on Monday when she was sick and asked to go back to the cell, uh, she could have been arraigned from the cell. Uh, so we. Uh, we note uh, some more detail on this uh, in the report, but we think it's something that's worthy of consideration and we hope that policymakers will take it up uh, uh, this session. On one of the slides, uh, you, you may recall, Ms. Turner was taken to be fingerprinted at about 2.15 in the morning, um, one that's obviously a, not, not a particularly convenient time. Um, uh, equally or perhaps more importantly, uh, she had already been in custody uh, beyond that 24-hour uh, time period that the Court of Appeals uh, said uh, that we should not exceed. Uh, and that was uh, because of training issues. There were uh, not, a, not enough uh, training and scheduling issues, not enough uh, Mount Vernon Police Department employees trained in fingerprinting. Uh, and, and so obviously having more people trained and available uh, would mean that fingerprinting could take place uh, earlier. And it's not just a sort of a, the ministerial act of fingerprinting. Fingerprinting is, is fundamentally important to uh, confirming identity, um, to uh, checking someone's criminal history record, um, and to see if they have any bench warrants. And uh, those are the types of considerations uh, that police officers uh, use when they're deciding whether or not to issue a desk appearance ticket. Um, so uh, in Ms. Turner's case, as we note in the report, a desk appearance ticket, or a DAT as they're referred to, uh, was highly unlikely uh, given her uh, warrant history um, and other factors discussed in the report. But for others, um, you know, early fingerprinting uh, could lead uh, to one, confirm who you have and confirm they have no criminal history and, conf and then you could look at the charge and the police would be more empowered and have more information to decide uh, whether or not this is someone who uh, uh, should be released and not spend uh, the weekend in jail, released on a desk appearance ticket. Uh, now, shifting a, a bit to the second recommendation, uh, second broad category uh, of recommendations in medical care. Um, I talked about the sort of the, the categories of the 15 minute or the 30 minute or the 24 7 um, check ins. Uh, at Mount Vernon, uh, principally those check ins are done by remote video. Um, and when we interviewed 
uh, police officers. They, were, so they, they, they volunteered that information pretty readily. Uh, state regulation makes clear that those checks must be done in person. Um, they cannot be done remotely. Remote checks by video can be um, uh, done as an adjunct, but the, but the, the visits that are ma mandated must happen in person. Uh, so we've, we've brought this to uh, uh, the police department's attention. It's our understanding they've already addressed it uh, and that uh, they are now doing these checks, all of them uh, in person and not remotely. Uh, and that the next step will be for them to update their policies to, to uh, make clear that the, the checks must be done uh, in person. Uh, we're also st we're still now in the category of uh, uh, medical care. Um, one thing that's striking as you look at the the, uh, the slides here is uh, obviously Ms. Ms. Turner was not 100% uh, well. She was vomiting and retching. The, the standard uh, that uh, is in place now for police departments of when to take someone to a hospital is in situations of an emergency nature. Um, and that is not uh, the most precise uh, language. Uh, and, I, and what we are uh, calling upon the, uh, the State Correction of Commission to do is to look at that language and elucidate it, to break out what exactly that means uh, so that um, law enforcement officers who are um, confronted with situations can have more guidance as to when to uh, seek medical care. Um, and so hopefully uh, well, they'll take a look at that standard and they will reevaluate it and we'll, we'll come back with uh, more specific guidance uh, for uh, police officers. And on my uh, last uh, slide here, um, the, the last uh, uh, thing that we uh, wanted to draw policymakers' attention to is, is uh, really a funding one, uh, which is that on that Monday, there was one attendant responsible for 28 uh, uh, arrestees, so checking up on 28 uh, people at the same time. Uh, and, and so we think the policymakers should take a look uh, at, the, at the funding levels and make sure that there's enough staffing to ensure compliance with uh, uh, regulations concerning access of care um, for um, arrestees or detainees. Um, so that's an overview of our investigation. Uh, you have the report, and I'll turn it back over to the Attorney General. Thank you. Thank you, Alvin. Um, so uh, the report provides a lot. A lot more detail, and as I indicated, we have a link to the video showing, and you saw some stills from the period of time, everything in the hours uh, prior to Ms. Turner's death, the last hours of her detention. As I said earlier, her death was a tragedy, and while we found that a prosecution for criminally negligent homicide would be unsustainable under the facts of this case, and gave examples of, of the cases demonstrating the very high bar for a homicide prosecution, for criminal prosecution in this case. It does not mean we didn't find problems and our, our, the problems we've noted and the recommendations we've made, both specific to Mount Vernon and generally, uh, we think are very, very important. They, uh, there is really no good reason why someone arrested for shoplifting has to wait 48 hours in jail before being arraigned, and this is something that we feel very strongly about uh, and obviously made some recommendations that we think are very important. It is uh, also just important to understand that the state does impose mandates for regular inspections and in-person inspections and things like that. But if you are in a police department where you have only have one attendant supervising 28 people, it's very hard to ensure the proper level of care. So these are issues that some, some of our recommendations relate to things done by the police department. I will say that the Mount Vernon Police Department has taken all of these recommendations under advisement and have committed to taking action on every single one of them. Uh, and as noted, the one employee who had uh, did the bad record keeping and wasn't really doing, doing the full job uh, they are proceeding against in it through an administrative proceeding. So that is the summary of our report. And with that, we can take questions. Can you identify and tell, yes, Matt, talk. talk. Well, 
Well, no, actually, the video shows them talking to her, interacting with her. She was asked on several occasions if she needed help. They, she was moved from cell to cell, so there was a lot of intera actual interaction. She's sitting up, she's lying down, uh, eating, drinking. So uh, the conclusion was that it was, uh, a, and she also repeatedly denied when she was brought into the jail and at the hospital uh, that she had consumed any drugs. There was no basis for suspicion of the level of medical problem that she had by the police. Uh, it is very troubling to see someone who is obviously sick, although, as Alvin indicated, vomiting is most often not a symptom of, of uh, a fatal condition. And in fact, the medical examiner did not find that that was related necessarily to the heart condition that caused her death. So, yeah, it's very troubling. And we don't... Uh, it, she didn't have to be in jail that long, but we didn't find any uh, anything out of line by any employee of the police department. They asked after her, they interacted with her. She indicated she was feeling better. She just wanted to lie down. So when you say to the family, well, we spoke to them this morning, and they are enraged. And they feel, despite their thorough investigation, and it was transparent that things are being swept under the rug, and that they feel like they've not gotten a good answer as to why their mother died in police custody. Like, what, what do you say to them? You want to mention that, Delvin? Met, met with yeah, so I, 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 I met along with others with the family, and, and frankly, I mean, there are no words that can console the family. So the, nothing to address those uh, specific sentiments you raised. We, we did a lot of listening, um, as I thought was appropriate. Um, we pointed them to the evidence uh, that we looked at. Um, I think by the end, the, the family, um, Mr. Turner, appreciated the thoroughness, as you just said. But, you know, in, in terms of, you know, words to offer a family in mourning, you know, I wouldn't be presumptuous enough to even offer them anything other than condolences. And that 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 is uh, mentioned in the report. I think those are two distinct issues. Uh, the the, uh, uh, the the fingerprinting is, as you said, as I said earlier, uh, 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 issue of, of staffing and training. The fact that there was no accusatory instrument was more a byproduct of the timing of the arrest. Uh, the arresting officer, as is indicated in the report, um, uh, was su supposed to uh, go to the, the district attorney's office to, pre to help prepare that. Uh, on Monday morning, um, and he was was called off to another assignment, and it didn't get done. It, is there anything about that policy that certainly weekends and that's what they do, and they know that Mondays are, are crazy and busy? And is there anything about that the, <clears throat> that the arresting officer should actually be doing that closer to the arrest, so that it's 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 there for for an arraignment to go forward by Monday morning? Well, well our 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 recommendations, as we say, is is to look at video taping arraignments to look at the fingerprinting so that people can have information to do a desk appearance ticket uh, so that, uh, you know, people won't be in jail, as the Attorney General said, for, for three days if the facts so warrant it, something like a, uh, this where Ms. Turner had other issues that, that if they had full information, they still may have kept her. Um, but certainly there would be instances of, instances of people who are arrested who, uh, you know, the information would come back from the fingerprinting uh, with no uh, signals that they should be detained and uh, under our proposals, the person more likely to be released uh, earlier before that issue that you're talking about comes up on Monday. What about the situation that I think you said it was <coughs> earlier, I didn't hear that. The fact that there was no real discharge directions to the police, <coughs> how significant was that, and, and what should the hospital have done differently? You know, our, the, on the... Mm -hmm. uh, you can go ahead. Uh, on the on the, the hospital, you know, our, our the scope of the executive order is for us to look at um, police conduct concerning unarmed civilians that results in death. And so, the the hospital visit was relevant to our inquiry to the extent it showed that the police department was responsive in, in taking her there, uh, and then when she was discharged, was not giving any specific directions. And in fact, the direction to her was to follow up 
with her care providers uh, when she's released. As to what happened and the quality of care there, and there you'd, you'd have to take that up at the hospital. But for the police aspect of it, her condition at the cell seemed to be worse after she came back from the hospital. Did the police uh, department wonder, well, we took her to the hospital, but now she's worse? Any follow up there? Well, if so, if you recall the the, the the slide where when she's coming back from the cell adjacent to the courtroom, uh, she was specifically asked not once but twice by two different officers how she was doing. So that so they followed up. They asked her. They said she, she said she was feeling better, uh, and this coming from uh, someone who had previously you know been empowered and requested to go to the hospital, uh, and the the policy of uh, of the police department is if someone makes that request. The hospital is right down the street. That they take the person. So I guess the family's and also hasn't asked that question yet. Okay, go ahead. I guess the family's principal frustration is that their mother died in custody and no one is being held accountable for it. I know you're not a physician, but do you believe that had she not been in jail because of her medical condition, she probably would have died that weekend, that Monday as well? Uh, we can't. We can't say one way or the other, and the medical examiner in Exhibit B provides the report, uh, essentially confirms that she, uh, uh, the, the, the death was tragic, and uh, we address issues relating to why she was uh, in jail for 48 hours for shoplifting uh, without having any opportunity to be arraigned. These are the, these are the basic issues, but given the standards that apply and the legal standards, the fact that we find that a, a homicide prosecution would be unsustainable, that a criminal charge would be unsustainable, doesn't mean that uh, there weren't things that happened that were wrong. So there, uh, we, we are empowered to address that through policy recommendations, but uh, there are administrative and civil avenues still open. This is the scope of our duty is, is to look for criminal prosecutions of law enforcement personnel, and it wouldn't be sustainable here. doesn't mean there aren't other avenues open. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.